Greetings. You are listening to Guiding Stars Evolutionary Astrology Radio, now being broadcasted through EA Zoom and YouTube. This is your host, Kristen Fontana. Guiding Stars is an interactive, soul-centered astrology talk show, and we use the symbolic language of evolutionary astrology to enlighten you and guide you upon this journey. Now, for almost 20 years, this show was being aired on Healthy Life Radio, internet radio, and we are now broadcasting it this way in this forum, although we do have one show still being broadcasted at Healthy Life with Rose Marcus, so that will be also offered to you in this forum. But uh, we're just transferring the show uh, in a different way, and we're able to bring all of my favorite guests (laughs) back and starting some new series together. Today I am here with Simon Forster from Sweden and we are initiating a new series on Saturn. So timely, Saturn and Aries or Saturn in the first house today. If you have this symbol in your chart, this is going to be very personal to you, I'm sure. Um, But Saturn is in the sign of Capricorn along with Pluto. And so we are all feeling the gravity of this energy. And when we know where Saturn is in our chart, when we understand this archetype, Um, It will allow us to capitalize on the opportunities uh, that are presenting themselves for our evolution. So um, before I bring Simon on, I do want to let you know if you're a new listener uh, that we do have a website available for you to learn more about evolutionary astrology. The website is schoolofevolutionaryastrology.com. And within that website, we have a wonderful learning forum. It's a message board that's free. You can participate in practice threads or post questions. And currently, I am leading a practice thread on the archetype of Lilith, who is an asteroid, uh, in, an asteroid that represents your ideal image of a woman or how you were created by God as a woman. Or for a man, this would be your ideal image of a woman. And we are looking at Lilith in various ways, but starting with Lilith and Aries, where this initiated, and we're working through uh, this archetype. Lilith as an asteroid, not resolution Lilith. People are familiar with her, the black moon Lilith, that crescent moon with the cross. That is a projected point in space. We are actually working with the asteroid Lilith, which is a physical body in the asteroid belt, belt it is your original nature and it does have nodes south node and a north node of lilith so join us if you'd like to share it a lot already you're welcome to jump in and participate or just read as you wish if you're also interested in becoming a more serious student we do have a correspondence course available uh, on the website which is the original course taught by the founder of ea uh, jeff green and there's more information on the website if you'd like to get a hold of that material. So I would like to welcome now Simon back to Guiding Stars in our new format. And we're uh, working our way uh, to a state of perfection here, right, Simon? <laughs> we're trying to uh, – this looks pretty professional, I have to say. I'm very happy. Thank you for all you've done to make this happen too. So welcome back. Thanks very much, Kristen. I appreciate that. And, um, you know, I just wanted to, to to talk about how this is really a perfection uh, process, considering that this is the first step in a completely new direction, you know, uh, for not only yourself, but um, for the way that we're going to essentially interact with uh, sharing EA to, to, you know, the community and to the people that are, you know, wanting to absorb and, and understand the soul's path and journey, essentially. So, that's um it definitely feels like some Aries energy in terms of uncertainty, but at the same time we have to, we have to jump into that feeling of courageousness and and really embody this uh, this new direction as a way to to grow right absolutely, and Saturn does have to do a time and new right. chapters and how we structure our life. And here we are in January, which is a Capricorn month. Of course, we are now in the sign of Aquarius, but it's very timely that we initiate this uh, new way forward, looking at Saturn in Aries or Saturn in the first house. And we're going to talk a lot about 
what this archetype means on its own mm-hmm. um, and also of course how how what it means to have it in Aries of the first and its relationship to the other houses but before we do that simon is there anything you wanted to announce or share uh, with the listeners yeah um so you can find uh my website at www raising-vibrations.com and uh, there's a whole sort of uh, you know space of content of evolutionary astrology articles that have been written new and full moon articles that have been written and there is also you know certain webinars and teachings that I've um, got on my site as well and and so yeah that's that's what I'm up to on my YouTube channel I've got uh, videos as well which you can also access through just typing in Raising Vibrations or Simon Forster um, in YouTube, and you'll see that there's a whole host of uh, videos that I've um, you know, done to contribute to the way of, of how to bring EA into, into the world. So, yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. And, yeah, there's so much available. There's so much free content for people to access and Uh, So happy to be here with you again today Mm -hmm. to offer more. So how would you like to start this show? I've got uh, plenty to share as well, but I'd like you to kick it off. I know you have a wonderful slide. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I've always, I've always been deeply fascinated by Saturn in a way that has actually been exactly how the energy works, you know, and that is maturity. (laughs) Um, I've been fascinated by Saturn before my Saturn return because it was something that I felt intuitively that was missing in my life that would, when it was integrated into my life and I worked with it in a healthy way, um, it would become the actual vehicle for how I could fulfill a sense of purpose or dream that I have. So in my natal astrology chart, I have Saturn conjunct the sun and it's in the 10th house as well and you know when when i well let me put it to you this way my, my relationship to saturn even though I, I talk about it as fascination it's also been something where the fascination has been a rejection like no i don't want saturn i don't like saturn and uh when i when i went through my saturn return and i sort of began to experience what I'd read in books and heard other people experience, I noticed that one thing was very clear. When you, when you were able to embrace this phase in your life as an opportunity to truly come back to earth and come back to a place of, if you plant the seeds of what you would like for your life, for for the rest of your life right now, and you begin honoring its presence, you'll actually begin to reap the rewards of all of the dedication and hard work and sort of self-reflection that, you know, takes place during your Saturn return. And I did that. And sometimes it was fun and sometimes it wasn't. But what came out of the end of it was this incredibly deep love for Saturn. And so the fascination was, I like it, but I reject it because I don't want to do that to, okay, I'm going to be forced to, okay, I'm doing it. And then eventually I did it. And I come out the other side and, I'm, and now every single person I speak to that I sense and feel that Saturn relationship to, that have the same Saturn relationship to, that in a sense has been influenced a lot by just natural astrology on the internet of bad experiences and stuff and people fear it, that I've began to or begun to kind of really, really put a lot of attention in healing the Saturn archetype in the psyche of uh, people through my own experience and my own relationship to it. And it's been really, um, I've had a lot of positive experience, you know, or positive feedback and positive experience in people. So uh, what I would like to to contribute today and which I was sharing with you before was to to look at the, 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 the structure of Saturn as a way for us to embrace this archetype into our lives and work with this archetype into our lives uh, where the things that we can be a, that we can fear, which is a Saturn component, 
um, we don't have to fear anymore because now we understand it. So really what I'm trying to say is I would like to, I want to approach the conversation from a place of helping understand Saturn. And I think that that is, that is something that um, I feel like we need and, and lacks to a certain degree in sort of just astrology in general, not like the EA um, community. And, and of course, there's always room for growth everywhere. Uh, so Saturn, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I wanted to met, I wanted to now that I'm feeling with Saturn is is in Capricorn squaring Mars today. Right. As we're talking about this, and you're mm-hmm. mentioning fear and our resistance to evolve. There's reasons why we're afraid to re-enter certain spaces. It creates a vulnerability with the natural square to Cancer on the other side, mm-hmm. or opposition. Excuse me from the Capricorn house to cancer is an opposition, but Saturn and Aries does square that cancer and uh, a fear of being insecure, a fear of being vulnerable is a big reason why we hesitate. But Jupiter and Venus are in Sagittarius right now, conjunct and trining Mars, which rules yeah. Aries. And this is illuminating something in your life. It's, it's igniting desires inside you and, and the, a truth inside you, a flame of truth is showing you a way, but we can't get something for nothing. That's what Saturn says. Exactly. You've got to make the effort. You've got to take the steps. And this today, as we speak, Simon, there's such a powerful transit going on just on the heels of this pair of eclipses. And so yeah. we're still well within the energy. So I just wanted to mention that for people listening. Absolutely. And, you know, you can't you can't just sit back and and go oh is is this really happening i mean look at look at the conversation today today we're starting a saturn in aries um show and as you mentioned saturn is actually squaring you know saturn's in capricorn and mars is in aries i mean not only are they in their own signs but there's an actual exact square happening today and how we start the show with saturn in aries it's like really is am i are we on are we on the same planet? You know, it's like, what's going on? This is in, this is crazy, but it's it's so, <laughs> such a beautiful expression of how powerful this knowledge can be when we develop a relationship to it that um, is therapeutic, but also where we can begin to embrace a deeper layer of uh, experiences that are inherently invisible to the physical realm, Saturn, and and begin to weave into our lives and harness the power and the potential of this, this energy or the energies. And I think Saturn in Aries is one of those archetypes that within a birth chart indicates a necessity for actually beginning to uh, harness the potential of Saturn in a completely new way, you know, and that, that there is a very strong sense of self discovery that comes along with Saturn in Aries in a birth chart. Um, I don't want to talk too much about that because, of course, we've got some birth charts over here. And I want to, for me personally, I want to kind of pull it back to to just talking about Saturn. But, you know, it's it's really, really amazing to me that we're sitting here and we're having this conversation where the planets are in their own houses and then they're squaring each other. It's like, what? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's, I'd like to definitely bring it back to the beginning as an archetype. Yeah. And I wanted to share many, many years ago uh, when evolutionary astrology conferences were happening and I was really new in this work. And I think it might have been the second conference or third that I had done, but it's still very shy and insecure with the material because it's so deep. And you know, I just wanted to get it right and wanted to talk about something I felt like felt like I knew well and Jeffrey said I want you to talk about Saturn <laughs> so, no I don't to talk about Saturn <laughs> you know it's just like that sounds so depressing what could I possibly talk about Saturn for an, how could I do that for an hour an hour and a half and <laughs> anyway it was an incredible experience and it was an important experience I mean I do have a 10th house moon so in Aries, so here we are, tenth house moon in Aries, talking about Saturn and Aries today. And um, but I will tell you, in my journey uh, with learning to love this energy, and believe me, when 
I mean, Saturn is transiting. Transiting Saturn is exactly conjunct my Mars today, too, by the way, Simon. Oh, <laughs> or, my gosh. Or within, reach, within a degree or so. This is not a coincidence. But um, there is, like you said, this harvest. When you put the time in, the discipline, the determination, mm -hmm. whatever it took, the blood, sweat, tears, um, there is a harvest connected to Saturn that no other planetary influence can offer, provide. And it's something sustainable. It's something that you can take with you. It's not uh, light and passing or fleeting. It's something you can really sink your teeth into. And mm -hmm. you can pull from in your future um, as you pull from the past of your own maturing, as you said, the time that you put in, uh, the discipline that was required, you never lose that. You never, ever lose that muscle memory. Mm -hmm. And the thing I wanted to share right out of the gates that I feel like is the most important thing in evolutionary astrology looking at Saturn is that Saturn is the archetype of conditioning. And it is obviously the structural nature of our consciousness. It's the thing that the bones, the skin, everything that holds our consciousness in place, the soul inside of us is supported by this Saturnian energy. Yeah. And so consciousness itself is Neptune. And it's formless, but it takes the Saturnian uh, containment or the this, this Saturnian structure to contain the soul. And so Saturn, as an archetype, conditions every other planet in the chart. And the way to understand this is that if you have Mars in the sign of Aries and you have Saturn in the sign of Capricorn, Saturn will condition that Mars and Aries. It's a little bit like walking into a house and all the walls and the floor and the ceiling are the, um, have the energy of Capricorn because your natal Saturn's in Capricorn. Or if your natal Saturn was in Pisces, the walls, the floor, the ceiling would be energized with Pisces. But you walk into your, your Mars room, which is Aries, and then it's combining Saturn in Pisces with that Aries energy. So you have it's conditioning that Mars and Aries within this example now Pisces. So it's important if you look at your chart that all of the planets, it doesn't matter if your sun's in Aquarius and your Venus is in a Cancer, it's conditioned by whatever planet your Saturn is in. So in today's example, if your Saturn is in Aries, it's conditioning all of the other planets. So when I really got a hold of this, it's about, it's about taking responsibility, really, for the totality of the energy that's in place in your chart and building something out of it. You know, it's, it's really about owning it, owning your entire, not just your nature, but everything that makes you you in this life, the chart you have chosen in order to cultivate what it is that your soul is trying to build and establish in this life. So I just wanted to share that right out of the gates because it is such a powerful planet and how it influences everything in the birth chart. Yeah, completely. And, you know, if I, let's see if I can switch over to, to the slide. Um, that is the natural zodiac. And, you know, the, the, the first thing that I want to really points out to us is if you notice just the circle don't look at the the, the signs etc but just notice the circle right that is how you can sort of connect with Saturn it is this uh, circumference that within the framework of this circumference we have the archetypes right and so this is what Kristen's talking about with you know how consciousness or how the how you cultivate the nature of your charts because what you're going to do is you're going to replace this natural zodiac with your birth chart and let's say saturn's in gemini then the container which is the circle here you know it's a boundary we often talk about you know saturn as the it is it's the boundary within consciousness that essentially holds the space for the soul to be present with obviously the soul is bigger than that but it is the finiteness of your physical presence on earth and so when you connect with this idea of saturn being conditioning everything in your charts you've got to look at everything in your life as the 
the framework for what is going to and what is holding your essence to grow into, to, to, to grow through, right. you know? Um, and that's why when, you know, when you sort of look at a spiritual state uh, awareness, the archetypes that would be associated with that would be Saturn and Neptune because you're dealing now with the, the container. You're seeing your life. You're the exact place that you're born and the, the family conditioning that you're coming into and the structures that are there and the, the values and the traditions and the relationship between mom and dad and how they are playing out as a conditioning factor for your early life imprinting and how that will shape the South Node. All of these these components, the social economic structure of dad and how he feels about life and what rules he puts in place and how mom responds to that and grandparents, all of that imprints onto your psyche that then essentially becomes the framework and conditioning field for your life. And you will notice that when you really, really get close to Saturn in your chart, it becomes increasingly apparent how deep that archetypal conditioning really goes in the sense of just as an example, one person had sat in an Aquarius and it was like, you could see the family history of a lineage of elitist type of uh, structures in the life and how that then imprints onto your life and the potential, whatever the chart is holding in that moment to either grow into another cycle of family history in which that becomes that Aquarius symbolism or it is a liberation from that you know mm -hmm. and it, yeah. it's it's profound to really really get the depth of what you just said there in terms of Saturn truly conditioning the natal chart but then when you see it in your own life because that's what the natal chart is reflecting your own inner space it's very apparent so yeah I wanted to um, have people just imagine that, again, I use the example bones and skin. This is all Saturn, the container that is holding your consciousness, Neptune, your soul is obviously uh, Pluto, but the, the consciousness, the word consciousness connects to, of itself connects to Neptune and it's formless. So if your skin and your bones, your Saturn element, let's say hypothetically is in the sign of Pisces and Pisces is, a, there's the energy of Pisces is, is highly sensitive. It's like this highly permeable membrane, inc incredibly sensitive to the collective, does not typically have strong boundaries. Use the word boundaries or barriers to protect itself. It's picking up the energy of everything in, in greater degrees than say somebody who has a natal Saturn in Capricorn. And so imagine that you have Saturn in Pisces. Maybe you have it retrograde. And I know that we do have a chart later with this example. Um, you are going to things with far more fervor and <laughs> sensitivity. And by just understanding that, it will allow you to feel more um, just aware of who you are, validated perhaps, understand this is why you're more sensitive than the next guy. Um, whatever it might be, but it is literally the energy that is holding everything together for you. And it is a blessing to have that kind of sensitivity, but in a world like we're living in, it can be um, a burden for sure. But just like you said, to understand your Saturn, there's so much power, there's so much capacity to evolve when we understand our roots and the structural nature of our consciousness and what's holding everything together. So we can, instead of fighting it, we can follow it and partner with it, which I think is a real important part of this message with the uh, aspect then to Libra, to partner with our own um, energetic field and, co and the structure of who we are. Yeah, that's right. And I loved what you said there, not fear it, follow it. You know, it's, it's almost, it's actually a state of, mind or a state of presence that allows that that brings in and welcomes what that symbol represents as an opportunity to let it grow in your life and let it support and structure whatever it is that the soul is intending to essentially experience from a deeper level and you know when when we talk about when we talk about saturn within the context of boundary 
you know, let's think about this in this way, right? Saturn, you talked about the skin and the bones and, and um, how, you know, Neptune is this, you know, very, very sensitive. It's this membrane. It's this liquid form. Think about the, 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 the nature of, of this natural sex style that happens between Pisces and, and Capricorn, okay? And then, of course, the natural trine that happens between Pisces and Cancer. And, and then we have this opposition here, right? And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because when we, when we understand, the, when we explore the deeper essence of an archetype, and we see, um, we see, say, for instance, Saturn in, in Pisces in a person's chart. These are the kind of things that will really get you to access um, profound understanding about how that archetype will be playing out for a person in their chart and in their life. Because we're looking at the relationship that Capricorn boundaries has to Pisces consciousness, this natural sex style. So we have truth and reconciliation. You know, how we talk about Capricorn as this, in, in, I think that there's a slight distortion with Capricorn where we take responsibility. And it's a very masculine taking responsibility in a way where as if the patriarchal, distorted, man-made laws are in place that are unnatural. And then how that leads to a guilt kind of complex where you're kind of breaking these imaginary, not imaginary, but these laws that are put in place that to a certain degree are actually incredibly um, damaging to our naturalness, right? Let's just just take a, a silly example that is incredibly, incredibly important in our culture today. The repression of sexuality through the judgments and shame that comes from cultural definitions. So here we have this Capricorn axis of cultural definitions and gender roles, okay, Cancer Capricorn, and the repression of our um, like emotional reality and natural anima animus through the, these, these very repressive dynamics, these repressive cultural uh, societal judgments that can be put on place and how we essentially interact with that. So we have this repressed sexuality that comes from what I've just shared. And I mean, you can go deeper into this uh, chart analysis over here, but I don't want to um, just to keep it kind of light that. So now you, you have this, uh, oh, you've got to take responsibility for your, your displaced anger that's coming out, but you don't know how to actually process this displaced anger. And in a sense, when we're coming from Capricorn as this take responsibility aggressive stance, it doesn't actually allow us to go into the part of us and acknowledge, which is really what Capricorn is about, truth, acknowledging that there is something here that has been repressed. And the, the difference is, that Capricorn's really feminine. It's not masculine. And in a masculine world, it's been shaped and distorted into this, I've got to go out there and do things and I've got to achieve the best versus it's actually a deeply, deeply reflective archetype that essentially is trying to create hindsight and reflection. And through the hindsight reflection, new choices get birthed, right? And out of these new choices, we're able to actually sense and feel our own healing and connect back to a place of what the soul is really kind of looking to grow within us. And this natural sex style between Pisces and Capricorn shows us that when an event has happened that maybe we felt wasn't the best way to act out because we potentially had, a, you know, we had like displaced anger and we kind of projected on somebody. If the Capricorn comes in and says, okay, look, I'm really, really sorry. I recognize that inside of myself through reflection, through time, that this might have not actually been about you. I realize it was about myself. I'm sorry. Is it, uh, do you forgive me? Right? So you acknowledge through Capricorn and then you, in a sense, if you feel the need to, or then there's the kind of forgiveness that comes through Pisces. And what does Pisces symbolize here? It symbolizes a reunion, even, even also simultaneously a separation. So the boundaries in Capricorn can, in Saturn, hold us in a place of separating so we can reflect on our inner space, sextile, but it also is the capacity where we can find union back with the other or with ourselves or with a deeper meaning in life. And, that, and that's how we actually heal through these, these archetypes. And the last thing I want to put across is just how this opposition to cancer and, and the, the trying to cancer is how we're actually evolving through the emotional body in a way where 
being able to hold space for ourselves and hold space as Capricorn teaches us to grow into maturity, right? So as we mature, we grow into deeper states of reflection, deeper states of, of acknowledging that this is a growth cycle. Yeah, and I was just on the message board writing about this very thing that it, and wanted to just share that it doesn't matter how evolved you are, what stage of evolution you're in. We talk a lot about looking at charts from an evolutionary perspective, understanding the chart of the soul in question <clears throat> based on what where they are, evolutionarily speaking. But it no, it does not matter if you're in the first stage consensus or uh, the third state. Uh, the spiritual, um, the third stage, excuse me, of the spiritual state, the most advanced stage of evolution, you will be feeling that fourth house push at all times because it is through that door, the emotional door that the soul evolves. And even though at an advanced stage of evolution, you're able to access more of that divine kind of unconditional love and support, um, you're still in you're still a human inside a physical body. You're still limited by that form. You will still feel all of those vulnerable emotions that any soul feels inside this human form. Uh, your ability to uh, grow through those experiences might be better as you evolve or stronger, but they don't stop. This is what continues to keep us uh, very conscious aware of where we, uh, where those insecurities still exist, where we need to do the work, uh, where we need to stay disciplined. But I you know I, it's something that I've really observed um, in the last 20 years in this work is that, you know, I think even, I think it even gets harder. I could say it gets harder uh, as the soul evolves in ways because as you evolve, you expand your consciousness, then you're taking on more, then you're asked to deliver more. And the only way to really be able to help others is to, to have lived something for yourself already, on your own, leaning on yourself, depending on yourself, cultivating those inner spaces that are, it's so essential in order for you to be able to uh, so for it to be able to support your evolution moving forward. So uh, that fourth house is always active. Yeah, that, that, was so, that was so beautifully expressed because, you know, to, to me, when, when you were talking about it, it just, it just pointed to how these archetypes, again, just interact with each other, you know, particularly. And so much of Saturn and what it represents in our, um, chart is the encompassing of that soul's journey, and so you can even look at at this the circle as the point of entry. You know, the point of entry. You've got the the Aries mm -hmm. sign representing the AC. You've got the Cancer archetype as the IC, and the you know Libra as the DC, and Capricorn as the MC, and this cardinal axis. You know, as you put the the cross into it, he has Saturn bringing you to Earth. This is your coordinates. You know. And it really, it really accentuates the, the time that is unfolding and how that time over, over time, literally, um, is how the soul is evolving, you know. And, and that's why I think astrology, astrology chart and the reflection of astrology is such a profound tool, especially in this time, as we begin to sew back the soul that has been disconnected from our sort of ego self um you know through for many reasons uh i just wanted to point out that you know with with today's conversation being you know saturn in, in capricorn immediately when you look at the natural zodiac there's an inherent square that takes place between capricorn and um aries and aries is an archetype for both of these signs are cardinal and they form uh two of the other uh two cardinal signs so four of them libra and we have uh, cancer here at the bottom. And we know that cardinal energy is about change. So in Aries, there's initiation. And inherently in Aries, the square to cancer says, I'm initiating a new direction, but there's an inherent insecurity. 
a feeling of I'm changing what is familiar and known. And as I go in this new direction, I'm going to initiate new relationship patterns. I'm going to meet the other in a completely new way and meet life in a completely new way. And this Capricorn energy over here reflects to us that journey, as you talked about earlier, that, that journey that we embody. And this natural square that takes place between Capricorn and, and Aries actually is where when we essentially start a new direction, we're going to break free Capricorn. Well, should I say we're going to liberate ourselves from the boundaries that once held us in a safety. And we're going to be wanting to spontaneously go in a new direction. And sometimes Capricorn doesn't like that. You know, Capricorn doesn't, it's not its role to go, okay, guys, let's be reckless with everything. And it's the complete opposite. It's like, let's, right. let's keep everything in a circle. Come on, come on, come on. Which is why the nature of judgment is associated <laughs> with Capricorn, right? Um, it would be funny to actually see, even though Jeffrey does talk about uh, Capricorn wanting to inherently lose control as a way to access the, the cancer archetype, but it, it's not going to naturally. But Aries wants to. And so you can see this natural tension between the desire for freedom and the desire for uh, safety and security and how when you do have this energy in your chart, you can struggle between this sense of wanting to explore versus this need for responsibility in your life. You know, um, I don't know if you've got. You know, I would say that. <clears throat> oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No, you go ahead. I was just going to say that with, in, with respect to Saturn and Aries, then I'm going to follow up to what you just said. There is a need to lose control. And with Saturn and Aries in the first house, it's because they want to. <laughs> uh, Saturn and Aries does right. want to be in control of their independence and their freedom. But this Saturn energy as an archetype does have an equal and opposite need to lose control. Mm -hmm. But through Aries, it's because they want to. I mean, Aries wants to throw off all the limitations. Right. Everything. And move into this archetype directly. <clears throat> I wanted to remind people that Saturn correlates to this natural boundary, of we, as we've been talking about. Um, not just the skin and the bones that are holding your soul inside. <laughs> but the natural boundary between the subjective, unconscious, and the unconscious. So there's a boundary there because the unconscious within us contains all of our memories. And if people had access to all of our memories of all of our past lives, you would be so consumed with what you did right or wrong that it would impair you in your growth. So there's a natural boundary there that was created by God, which creates its own kind of stability. We have to re-enter spaces that are unresolved if the past has been interrupted in some way and as we all know we pick up where we left off and if we were to read the past because of having to relive it because it was not resolved and we have full memory and vision of what happened and there's an experience where we know we were completely abandoned or betrayed by somebody we're going to hesitate. We're not going to want to re-enter that space, but it's something the soul has to do. So there is a natural boundary there between the subjective unconscious and the unconscious, and that is Saturn also. Thank you so much for sharing that, by the way, because I'm busy doing some work on uh, integrating Chiron into, and um, of course, Chiron you know, has a very strong association with, with the Saturn uh, Aquarius archetype and I drew this over here to just illustrate that boundary in the natural zodiac where Capricorn sits here and then there's that boundary between Aquarius the subconscious individuated subconscious and the collective unconscious Neptune you know and uh -huh. it's so it's so important to realize that that when we do sort of deep therapy work and we go into the to understanding the relationship between the subconscious and the conscious and that boundary that Saturn actually puts in place, uh, we, we will, we will essentially like not re-engage in something because we're aware of that abandonment of that trauma and it prevents us from, from actually healing it to a certain degree. So they have to happen at, at like sporadic 
uh, moments versus just being fully conscious of that multidimensionality. Um, I think it's it's very important because too much stuff coming to the surface, you just go, you're going to, you know, complete, you won't be able to handle it. So that natural boundary there is. That oh, there's no way. <clears throat> We know in looking at these three symbols, Capricorn, Aquarius, and meditation, um, excuse me, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces. Yeah. In meditation, let's say someone makes a decision to meditate and they're sitting in that space and they're going to spend their time doing this, Capricorn. Meditation starts with breath. That's Aquarius. And the soul wanting to access something timeless. So as the breath stops and the soul reaches a state where time stops too, <laughs> and there's no more cause effect, it's the soul accessing the state of timelessness, um, the body will experience something that feels like an earthquake, right? Because the soul is accessing that space of timelessness. And so all the support, the Saturn support, that you are depending on and needing the breath to survive, everything goes away. The breath stops, time stops, and then that experience of an earthquake occurs. And so it's interesting how you can see it in this continuum of energy, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces in, yeah. the, in this way. No, that's, that's, it, again, beautifully put and a really, really healthy way to begin working with Saturn. Um, I've actually got a video on my YouTube at the moment that was just recently released, maybe like two and a half weeks ago, where it was a dialogue with Saturn. And just talking about the different ways that Saturn represents itself in our chart, you know, family dynamics, the path to individuation. And, you know, I, we've got two charts that I'm sure we want to look at. Um, but this this path to individuation being that the individuation process with that is held within the soul, you know, in the Aquarius realm, it's, it, it has to come through the ego structure. And again, we're looking at the cancer Capricorn axis again here, and we're seeing that the ego is formed in cancer, but there is a boundary that, in, you know, holds the ego sense of self in place, which is the Capricorn archetype. So when we're reintegrating the individuation process, that, that like integration has to come through the context of Saturn. So there's another profound point of how Saturn Capricorn in the 10th house in the chart will show you very clearly how the soul has set up a structure to essentially on one level absorb and on another level kind of um, embrace or mature into or grow into what is inherently coming through from the soul. And that the Saturn in your chart represents mm -hmm. a very clear way that that is going to specifically work for you because that will obviously support other dynamics in the chart that are essential. You know, it's not just random that you have Saturn in the first house and then Pluto in the third or so. There's always going to be a very, very clear reason for it, you know. Yeah, it's about owning it, owning your who, who you are as an individual, that Saturn. Mm -hmm. It's committing to it. It's taking responsibility for why you're here and what you've come here to do. And there's an, a pressure that comes with that energy and that's necessary in order for anybody to grow. Exactly. So shall we look at uh, a chart that, uh, well, we've got yeah. two charts and um, we'll, we'll start with this one over here that, you know, there's quite a lot of activity actually in the first house. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Yeah, so this is a woman uh, who she's, gosh, uh, just finished her Saturn return a bit ago. Uh, a really powerful time is the this, halfway through the first Saturn square after the Saturn return. I would say 32, 33 years old. That's okay. actually the exact time uh, that I became an evolutionary astrologer. Okay. And uh, so. Oh, yep. So that was a Saturn return there um, a couple of years, well, a while ago now, because Saturn is in the second house here. Yeah. But um, this is a woman who, if you think about what I shared earlier, Saturn conditions all the other planets. Mm -hmm. This is this is a wild child, <laughs> gypsy soul, had very 
many nomadic lives in the past. She is a Sag to the core, obviously a Sagittarius sun, but that Saturn and Sag conditions every other planet. Her need for freedom is total. And when I first right. met her, she was wearing buckskin and had a backpack and she walked into an evolutionary astrology conference. She'd just been living out on the land and doing primitive skills, uh, adventures and workshops. And everything she had was sitting in that backpack. I mean, she was just natural to the core. And then you, uh, I mean, her need for freedom, for adventure is just, her appetite for it is just voracious and still is. Yet there's this feeling of wanting to uh, find a way to be in society that allows her to um, be respected, um, you know, very uh, lofty, had lofty ambitions, and ultimately she became a doctor. And so look, when I first met her, she was as wild as they come. And yet coming into her 20s, she had to figure out a way to fit in the world okay. and to appear professional and, and, and everything else. And yet as a doctor, she also has these, like, this, these primal roots and a connection to natural medicine but she's in a formal world practicing medicine. So it's very much an East meets West phenomena. Yeah. And I would say too, that, you know, her greatest struggle um, has been around being able to be in relationship. Uh, you can see her need to be in relationship with Pluto and Venus, balsamic and Scorpio in the 12th. I mean, it's total to be able to merge with someone, yeah. but there's this, Cardinal energy always active about wanting her freedom and yet wanting to be with the partner. And it becomes this emotional paradox that she's created for herself. So she's attracted people that only meet some of her needs, not all of them. So it always guarantees her an exit point. Okay. Uh, you know, ultimately it will take a certain sort of partner that allows, or that has the same need for freedom, that doesn't coddle her too much. Uh, of course, someone who cherishes her, but not makes her the central center of their universe, where she can, you know, have a little bit of both worlds happening here. So a lot of ambition, a lot of drive, a lot of passion. Um, you know, she's in, an incredible athlete in the world. I mean, anything that she can do on a surfboard or a snowboard, um, she's first in line for. So she's very wild in her essence and her nature and learning how to work her way into the world, honoring that nature, but also being a part of society and being able to provide for herself, not leaning on a partner financially in any way. And so that's how this Saturn in the first manifests. And anybody who ever tries to step in and curtail this need for freedom is gone. Okay. She reacts you know, to that kind of experience. Um, necessarily so. This is right. something her soul. Look at this Saturn Sun conjunction is balsamic. We yeah. put the Sun, the Sun is a center point here. Saturn has come all the way around the zodiac. So, so and it's making these beautiful trines to her North Node. Yeah. And so, a question that I have is with the. the this T square that happens between, I suppose, and it's, you know, maybe Chiron and uh, Mars, Jupiter. So maybe we just focus on, on those squares that are taking place over here between Pisces and Sag. Uh, you know, her relationship to discovering her intuition and trusting herself over and above, say, for instance, um, other, maybe other people's vision or other people's ideas about what or sense of individuality. How did that show up for her with Saturn in the first house needing to be almost like asking her to, uh, you know, validate and bring her intuitive self, her that, that part of herself that was inside of her that said, this is my vision and this is what I wish to take and do with it. Has that, did she ever reflect that as a, as not necessarily a struggle, even though it's those tension aspects there, but a need for, well, maybe that's what you were sharing. She's, she's trying to find how she can bring her creative free self to a world that is essentially still held within a more methodical Saturn 
not as intuitively defined. You know, we don't live in a world that honors a lot of medicine healers and artists and storytellers. It's, right. You know, right. Which is what I suspect that the soul can be incredibly profoundly uh, great at, which is the capacity to really teach us what life is like through natural experiences versus maybe having to learn academic, not saying that you, know, like you said, she became a doctor. So, you know, both sides of this, that situation is apparent in her life. And I wonder what that, that square shows. Well, you can at. see that, you know, Neptune rules the Mars, Jupiter, moon and Pisces in the fourth and that Neptune's in her second. Mm -hmm. So there's a need to, um, all these all these themes around self reliance emotionally financially being a woman in a man's world right. not feeling limited in any way by that establishing herself and her own authority in the world again there's a lot of codependence and attachment to partners in the past that have um, you know put her up on this giant pedestal and in many ways provided for her and in every way um okay. and this life she, she wants to shoulder mm -hmm. it all on her own i mean not that her own pursuits have not been important in other time in other right. times but she's been she's had relationships mm -hmm. for many lifetimes where she's been worshipped and uh and and totally taken care of in every mm -hmm. way and so it, you know she wants to be able to shoulder at least half of that on her own and by the way, when you, I, you, you would not even recognize the person I met initially compared to how she presents herself in the world today because she has to. She lives in this world of alternating extremes between the professional woman and everything else that's going on inside of her, which is this, this wild and free-spirited gypsy soul. Um, right that's very drawn to natural ways and medicines, but also understands that there's a place for the Western world and how we heal people and take care of people. Right. Um, and so there, it's about balancing both worlds and finding a way within it where she can also evolve uh, emotionally, um, but also uh, emotionally, of course, is the way we've been talking about how anybody evolves. Yeah. I would say, the emotion part that hasn't been tended to enough in other times. It's always been about the adventure that she's been after. So exactly. The square from Saturn in Aries to the fourth house being thrown back on herself perpetually through her partnerships that she's chosen and entered in the past. I mean, this is evolving for her. She's come through a Saturn yeah. return. She's in her thirties. And so she's progressively attracting people that are more inwardly stable themselves and more balanced. Um, mm -hmm. so but with the Pluto, Venus, Balsamic, and Scorpio, there's just a lot of karma around her partnerships that have been extremely imbalanced right. in the past. Okay. So that's, that's, a, that's really, really, um, you know, great to see because he has the Saturn also functioning with the square, the natural square to, to Jupiter where so Jupiter's what in the first quarter square to Saturn here, and it's an indication right. that she's you know she's trying to actualize an, inherently a vision Jupiter that is culminating Pisces something about the past with that balsamic uh, Venus Pluto there around relationships, but also trying to at the same time actualize a new vision into the world that is rooted in what from from what I can understand is a desire to not be too extreme in both visions, i.e. One, one being completely free right. and then not feeling that stability. And then on the other side, being so disconnected from one's own inner space, inner intuitive place that it's almost like a feeling of hopelessness or meaninglessness that then, you know, feels to me like it could actually bounce the soul back into um, going like, okay, I need to do the opposite. And now this with the Saturn of the first house, especially with the sun, there's kind of like a, a need to find, like you said, this balance of integration and seeing and, and almost like weaving two visions together in a holistic way as they both represent one side of the coin, but together they are balanced, right? 
right? Her sense of identity and purpose is, is completely uh, all about her role in society and her career and her profession and, and being a doctor in the world and, and helping others heal. That is, um, but there's this need, there's this need for nurturing and a need for connection. Uh, and as you said, it, it, you know, her, her identity is not because of a relationship she's in. It's absolutely a result of, yes, at Leo Midheaven, um, her creative life purpose and what she, how she brings who she is to the world. Uh, and there is a special sense of destiny um, that she comes into this life with. But <clears throat> to balance out these emotional components, starting with her own inner relationship to herself, how she nurtures those spaces, not just in her need for time alone and to hole up and be on her own, which she does have, um, but to be able to nurture those inner spaces emotionally to a mature and evolve then through these relationships, these very karmic relationships that she's attracted mm -hmm. um, in the past. Um, you know, her soul is trying to birth a new way of being in relationship, which starts with her need for independence and non-attachment and, and no more codependency. Right. Right. Depending mm -hmm. on those partners to um, put her at the center of their universe. It's right. about balance now. Yeah, really, really well put. And I and I really liked what you talked about as how the soul is, you know, wanting to also integrate into society and, and kind of bring this this vision of healing into it. You can see how there's that repeating theme, Leo mid heaven. So Leo on the 10th house, Saturn is the same archetype as the 10th house, you know, and then you've got Saturn conjunct the sun <laughs> uh, in the first. Right. The right. I'm so glad that you brought that up, uh, Simon. It's just, I cannot reiterate this enough. The importance of when you're looking at a chart in terms of interpreting it or through transit, that the repeating theme that you spoke about, this is what allows you to secure uh, a picture of someone or a story or to be able to know that what you are tuning into or picking up uh, mm. is true. When it, when the theme repeats, when you can't continue to follow it, you can find the groove that you need to focus on in a chart. It occurs with these repeating themes that you spoke about again, natally or through transit. And then you can have the confidence to follow that energy, that, that message for your yep. client or for whoever, whoever's chart you're looking at. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, so we, we've, got, we've got another chart here that we can uh, take a look at. And uh, this, this one was really interesting to me because uh, I'm on, on some level, this, this Saturn, so I know this person really well as well, and the Saturn actually sits in opposition to my Mars and Venus. And um, it is also, in a sense, how I'm able to connect with the Mars and Venus in my chart as a, as a healing point, right? So Mars and Venus in my chart are squaring, squaring my nodes. And um, my midheaven also sits right here at, at 26, 25 degrees uh, Libra. And what I wanted to share with this chart with the Saturn in the first house was this person uh, just recently gave birth and the, when I see, you know, when, when I looked at this person's life, it was very clear to me that with Neptune being the, the planetary ruler of, of uh, Saturn over here, you know, we're talking about the repeating themes, you can see that, that Neptune is on the nodal axis, right? And so is Uranus, okay? They're in Capricorn over here, they're on the nodal axis, so there's a very strong indication of these planetary archetypes and then of course by extension Saturn because it's ruling this that whatever takes place on these nodes or on this planetary system over here is going to deeply impact the context of what Saturn's doing and as you can see Neptune uh, sorry not Neptune um, yeah Neptune by transit is sitting over here at the moment so just draw the line I just want to show you how these transits brought about this incredibly profound experience so you have um, Neptune sitting here at the moment of like 14 degrees Pisces so just on top of that Saturn and then you have uh, Pluto that's just about to hit the Neptune 
And at the time of the, the, the child being born, the son, literally the son of the, of the child, as in the son, son of the child, uh, lands here at, at 24 degrees Capricorn. Okay. So here's, here's, here's the mother that gives birth to their child. And the child gets born with the sun in between, impacting the squares to the nodes. And at a time where Jupiter was also sitting here on top of the Mars. Okay. So we've got Jupiter there. Here we've got these symbols over here. I think Venus was even returning to the exact same point. So here you have, again, like I said, this, this mother that gives birth to a child where on the synastry chart, you're going to have incredibly profound activations. And then, of course, you've got natal Uranus or transiting Uranus on top of this person's south node. Now, I know that's a lot to take in, and I apologize for that, but I feel like it's really, really crucial because as the child comes into the world, the soul experiences an incredible, strong impression of patriarchal conditioning that, in a sense, not only speaks to the sadness and the, 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 um, the reflection of how patriarchal oppression has deeply, deeply disconnected us from the feminine in, in almost to the point where we have completely uh, lost faith in our intuitive capacities and we have applied, like had this, this super identity placed over it that says, don't trust mother nature trust our intellect and it's not to go to the extreme where we forget about the capacities that we've been able to create using this masculine form i mean we're using technology at the moment to allow us to have this but in terms of what is essentially natural and natural motherhood and a child coming into the the, the earth the the relationship between the symbiotic relationship between the mother and the child was broken and separated so firstly, the doctor said, you can't do this because this happened. And we know that this is not true because what they wanted is they wanted a schedule in which the baby needed to come out. And the baby said, I'm not ready. And so they kind of pushed it consistently. And here's this mother sat in the first house in Pisces, feeling completely overwhelmed that their sense of authority is they have to surrender their sense of authority or they surrender their sense of authority because the uh, structures sort of said to her, this is what the rules are. This is what you have to believe. And he has the soul with all these squares and tensions saying, but I feel something different, but there is no support. There's a complete like lack of support. Mm -hmm. You can see how this moon is in opposition to all of this over here, even squaring it. And the, the, what this chart speaks of with the Saturn in the first house is, as this child comes in, it gets born into a time in which one of the things that's really heavy for us right now is the, the realization of how much repressedness there is on the natural, uh, on, on women and how we have up until this point in time really, really neglected this aspect of ourselves with inside of ourselves. And it's showing up as women wanting to break out and become more natural in their way and more free in their way. And, you talked about Lilith, you know, this is the work that you're doing with Lilith essentially is, is bringing this part of ourselves back to the world. And I, you know, I don't know where Lilith is in the chart, but the focus with Saturn over here is consistent impressions from early life of a deep patriarchal father that was incredibly judgmental, that was incredibly, um, you know, hypocritical, that had deeply deep, had a deep struggle with um, alcoholism. And also that there was an intense surrender. I mean, this child was actually locked in a car for a period of time because it needed to be taught a lesson that if you're crying, then you, you're, you're like, you're, the, the word in South Africa is called a sissy, right? You're, you're weak. And he has these impressions of Saturn in the first house with Pisces over here that your, your parents or the, the, the protection mechanism around you has failed you. It's not there. And so your own sense of authority is so broken in this experience that when you come to a point in which your own child is coming to be born, the mother can't actually feel present enough to say, this is not okay, or this is not okay, I have control over it. Now, again, this is a, in South Africa. So, 
you know, it's a little bit behind in terms of Western culture. It's maybe not as extreme. I know in Sweden it isn't this extreme, but this is an actual reality of the soul coming into this lifetime. And here you can see this, this Pluto 29 degree in the ninth house, right? In Scorpio, this, this empowered abandonment of one's own natural law. And the intention with this balsamic um, Mars Venus to, to actually come into this lifetime and, you know, relive certain experiences that were incredibly repressive. And the reason why it's, it's profound to me is not only because my midheavens on this nodal axis over here, but it also brought a realization to me of how it was really important to begin supporting from a man's perspective and nourishing and protecting and helping the feminine rise during a time where there is a lot of oppression, even if it doesn't look apparent from the top, but a lot of distortion in the Capricorn archetype in which that repression says you can't breastfeed your child in the public because the breast, the body, the satin has been sexualized. I mean, just to, to kind of right. speak a little bit more to this, the soul, when they found out that they were actually uh, pregnant, felt was so ashamed that they had failed because they actually became, um, uh, they were, they were actually studied to be a, a psychologist and a trained therapist. And Jupiter was on the Pluto at the time that their graduation was taking place. And then Jupiter entered the 10th house and they were, they were dealing with this realization that they were pregnant. And, you know, this, this collective shame of I've failed. I've failed everybody. I'm shameful. I need to reject this. And I actually see that even though this ex entry into the child. Well, I just want to know if the, the baby's child, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the baby's fine. The baby's amazing. The baby was born with the moon and the awesome. And I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, because I didn't know this story. No, huh? no, the baby's the baby's good. The baby's right? good, but the the baby had moon and Aquarius. Okay, okay. <laughs> and the the point of the Saturn was that instead of the baby coming, uh, it was a cesarean section, unfortunately, and so the baby kind of came out out of its own will. You know, it had to surrender its will. I mean, here's how this mother gives birth yeah. to a child with Saturn right. first, but they couldn't do it the natural way. So. They're in an incubator. Mm -hmm. They're just like getting some breath, et cetera, and like some air. And, you know, this, the baby's fine. It's healthy. It's beautiful, et cetera. But the experience of the mother connecting to that symbiotic relationship was broken. Initially, at least. And that brought oh, a lot of past yeah. life trauma. And again, the intensity of the experience is not like, oh, my God, there's this drama. It was just a very, very clear, apparent realization that this child was bringing through not only an, an incredible healing potential, because it definitely had the impact on me, but also how the circumstances were bringing to the surface, Capricorn, Uranus, Neptune, collective, you know, stuff that we're trying to work through right now as Pluto transits that. And how the Saturn in the first house represents the sole gradual process of coming back to confronting those those societal judgments and persecutions of this is how you should raise your child and this is how you should raise your child and you should do that, you shouldn't do this and constantly going, no, don't care, not going to do it that way, I'm doing it my way, you know? So even on the other side, mm -hmm. the soul actually has the potential where they do, they go like, look, sorry, this is how I'm going to do it. But the wounding around loss of trust of their intuitive capacity that gets stimulated by this experience that then sets the soul off to realize, you know what? I've actually got to trust my intuition, even in the face of collective projections of what I should and shouldn't do, you know? Well, that was a, an incredible example and very different than the one before. <laughs> um, also because of Saturn and being in Pisces versus Saturn being in Sagittarius in the first right. house, very different. Also this Saturn is, uh, is retrograde. Yes. So exactly. there's a re having to re repeat some some past experiences along these lines, and of course, a great grief uh, mm -hmm. goes along with this. You talked about reflection. It's a depression. It's a grief at what's happened to the natural ways of becoming a mother, natural ways of being in the world, and a lot of the guilt that those two or the couple took on as a result of conditioning, it's, it's not natural guilt, it's conditioned guilt or exactly. remorse or regret, or I failed. It's nothing to do. You know, this soul wanted to come through. It, they, the soul came through 
um, and an act of love uh, naturally. And so it's what we do with our conditioning that becomes a problem. And anything that is learned over time uh, that we've taken on is meant to be expunged. It's meant to be thrown off. Anything that is natural that we have guilt about, which is a Saturn uh, experience, um, then natural guilt is meant to stay in the soul forever. So we don't do whatever we did uh, that created that guilt. Um, right. But there's a, a large amount of conditioned and learned guilt that people lug around that they don't need to. And this is one example of it. Um, yeah. So hopefully the child and the raising of this child will offer some healing for both of them. Right. All right, Simon, we need to close the show. And uh, I'm sure there was just another several hours we could have talked about Saturn and Aries or Saturn in the house. Um, but we're going to <clears throat> come back with Saturn in Taurus or Saturn in the second house next month. And I just, Thoroughly enjoyed our new system together. I love the visuals. <laughs> I love connecting with you in this way. It feels like an evolved expression of guiding stars. It is. And yep. I hope all of you listening were able to benefit um, by this, uh, the initiation of the series that we have together. Any last thoughts for you, Simon? Um, it just to kind of echo what you were saying, you know, this is really um, an amazing space to, to connect and share this material. And I really had so much fun and um, on the screen at the moment is uh, a way that you can connect to both myself and Kristen. And, uh, you know, if you've got sat in the first house and you're looking to process through some stuff um, and you feel like you want to, to talk about it and have a reading, et cetera, then um, that, is, that is where you can contact us. And I'm super, super looking forward to talking about Saturn to the second house and throughout the whole houses. And I really hope that, uh, you know, everybody uh, finds value in what we've shared today. All right. Thank you so much. Yep. We'll be together for the next year. <laughs> all <laughs> in turn. And all of us are going to be experiencing Saturn and Capricorns, Pluto and Capricorn for a long time here still. So yeah. it's a way to, to understand how to move through this gracefully or as best as we can. So thank you so much. We'll be back next month with Saturn and I will be back here next week uh, with Rose Marcus looking at the transits for next month until next time. Namaste.